Today we're fortunate. To, today we have uh, Wei Sheng uh, Li from what I call Slack, what used to be Slack in the good old days uh, at uh, uh, Stanford uh, University. Uh, uh, they've converted into a really a superb uh, X-ray facility. It's interesting. Back when I was uh, young and a graduate student at Berkeley. I took an e &M course from Jackson, the very same Jackson wrote the book and he was just excellent. And the homework problems was to say if you had Slack, which was you know a, a high energy uh, electron accelerator and you bounced a photon off of the electron coming out of Slack from a laser, what would be the energy of the electron photon that bounces back? And then we have to you know, solve the, this problem. And, but that's in fact what they're doing these days uh, it's Slack, and it's an amazingly capable uh, X-ray analysis uh, facility. Uh, and so we're going to hear some really interesting things today about that. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank you for the uh, hospitality that you invite me here uh, to give this presentation, have this opportunity uh, to you know, talk about some of our recent work and also thank for Bob for the very nice, kind introductions. So today I'm going to talk about some of our uh, recent work to study on the charge order phenomenon in Cupre. And if I have time, then maybe talk a little bit about the Nicolet superconductors. Um, so let me start out by acknowledging of our collaborator here. So here I'm in depth to my uh, small group here. Um, so the, for the work I'm going to talk about today, primarily was done by Hai Yulu and Matteo Rossi. Uh, the, both of them have just left the group last year um, and also have a lot of collaboration from the experimental side also with uh, uh, the exchange group. A theory that we have a lot of collaboration with Tom Devers and uh, also from Harold Huang's group for this inf uh, infinite Nicolay sy uh, system. And for the work I'm going to talk about, um, uh, about this charge order phenomenon, also have a lot, a lot of input and uh, uh, discussion with Yang Zanen at the University of London. And the sample uh, um, we use for this study is coming from Japan, from ICE, leaked by Hiroshi Saki. So here uh, on the, on, on the uh, right hand side are our collaborator that help us to do uh, the risk measurement, including the Mineno group, led by Giacomo uh, Pinheri, and also we use uh, facility. For the data I'm going to show today, we'll actually obtain uh, several different facilities, including ESRF, uh, Diamond Lysos, led by Kirchin Joe, uh, Advanced Lysos at Berkeley, and also SSIL. And the project is funded by the Department of Energy. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. So I first give you a very brief introduction about uh, what I'm going to talk about in the charge order phenomenon in Cupre. And then I'd like to spend a few time to, to introduce RICS, resonant inelastic X-ray scanning, which is the technique I'm primarily uh, to talk about today. And then I'd like to highlight our work in the uh, charge order phenomenon in the Bismuth 2212 Cupre. I will talk about, I'm sorry. I will talk about the behavior of a charge order parameter and also, the signature of a charge order excitation. I mean, the excitation that's emanating away from the charge order. And from the computer their behavior, we find a very interesting paradox. And we think there might be, uh, for now, we're still kind of like not fully sure what we're seeing there. But I think that we'd, we'd certainly love to hear more from your input if you have any suggestions. And then if time permits, then I will talk a little bit about charge order, our recent observation of charge order, also in the Nicolet superconductor. Uh, uh, and then give a very brief summary. Okay, all right. So just like all the Cooper talk, I need to start with a phase diagram, and I'm no different. So this is a phase diagram of the Cooper. As you can see, it's very complex. There are several different phases um, in the phase diagram, and but to me, what I find it's, it's amazing is that this. If you look at the Cooper, it looks like a deceivingly simple system. What I mean is that, you know, if you look at the crystal structure, it's a square lattice. It's a very simple geometry. And if you look at the electronic structure, it's a single band system, just like what you see, uh, we have learned from angle result photo emission experiment is basically a single sheet of Fermi surface. So it's a single band system. And of course there are other uh, competition, you know, or, or interplay with the order. But then you can see with all this, this ingredient, you get 
you can yield such a very complex uh, phase diagram and mean that even if this kind of um, looks like a simple, but it can already have a very complex um, uh, inter interplay and give a lot of different phases. And I think also that's very interesting is that this phase diagram appear to be quite universal across different family of recuperant. Right? What I mean by that is that we, nowadays we know there are many different family of recuperant, but their phase diagram all looks similar in terms of the growth feature. For example, they all have supercontending domes, obviously, and they have anti interactions, and also this pseudo gap phase, you know, strange metal phase, and also the charge order phase. So here, this is a, a topic that has been extensively st uh, studied in this in, in, in the field. So I'm not, I, obviously I cannot go into much detail to review this work. So I would, uh, I would recommend uh, for those who are interested to know, learn a bit more about recent progress of the field, I, I suggest there's a talk by uh, 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 Professor Steve Kefferson. Uh, he also uh, he gave a seminar two years ago, also in Harvard, to talk about the progress of high temperature superconductors. So today here, I'm just going to focus on this very, very small range uh, 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 portion of the like aspect of the phase diagram, which is the charge order uh, in in this in the phase diagram. So charge order, as you know, that charge order is a state that the charge form a periodic modulations. So taking the phase value, it seems to be very incompatible with the superconductivity because superconductivity, it like to be delocalized, right? It like to be freely flowing, but the charge order on the other hand tend to localize the electrons. So these two kind of ground states seem to be very, very incompatible. But nevertheless, the experimental evidence of the charge order in Coupe is extensive. So for example, STM have seen this, um, you know, uh, period four um, patterns in the real space. And also even in the transport measurement in the early days, when you do transport measurement uh, in a high magnetic field, that you see the quantum oscillations also indicate of the existence of a charge order and things like that. And also MMI experiment. And of course, for the scattering experiment, like neutron scattering and X-ray scattering, you can really look at the diffraction peak that arises from this symmetry breaking state, and that provide even a direct, uh, more direct evidence about the existence of a charge density uh, of a charge order. And what's amazing is that this is not not just found in one particular cuprate. Basically, this charge order state has been found in almost all the cuprates. So that just like superconductivity and anti and the, also the anti you know, uh, interaction. So this raises an important question: is that how relevant is this charge order state uh, in the in the cuprate at this time? Right? right. So here, if we let if we look again in the phase diagram of the of the cuprate, you can see that there are a couple of things that can put this charge order an interest question that we can raise. Right, try to put into a context of the phase diagram. For example, there are a couple of, of quantum critical points in the phase diagram. Right? You see here has been indicated a couple of these possible quantum critical points. Whether charge order has anything to do with those points. Right? And the other thing that is um, uh, interesting is that you see this, this phase here, the charge order, they seem to have a very large overlap in the phase space with the pseudo gap phase. So whether the charge order has anything to do with pseudo gap phase is also one of interesting question. And of course, whether the charge order uh, is related to superconductivity or what kind of interplay, what kind of interaction they have between each other is all interesting question. So now this also has been extensively studied for the last decade, okay? But most of the world will focus on the behavior of the order parameter, charge order parameter. So what I uh, try to show you here is that using risk this technique, we can not only measure the charge order order parameter, but we can also look at the excitations that arise from the charge order that could give you a bit more information to address those questions. Okay, so now I'm going to the second part, uh, the, the introduction about the RIGS. Uh, so for the technique, all the data I'm showing today is, is uh, taken by the, the recent inelastic X-ray scattering RIGS. So this is basically the photon in, photon out spectroscopy. And to utilize the resonant process, what we mean by resonant process is that we tune the incident photon energy of the X-ray to match one of the, the absorption age of one of the elements, okay? So then, for example, in this case, for the case of uh, experiment I'm going to show you uh, today is we use couple LH that will basically promote 
uh, electron from the core level of 2p level and promote it to the occupied 3p level state. Okay. And then in the second step of the process, okay, one of the occupied electrons will drop back to fill this whole hole. I think the remote people can hear. Oh, okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Give it a quick quiz. Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Um, right, so you would, one of the, the, the electron will come down to fill this core hole and emit the photons. And this will leave the system in an excited final state, right? And this is now known that this excited final state can couple to a range of ele uh, elemental excitation, including magnetic excitation, such as magnon, paramagnon, two spinon, and all orbital excitation, okay? and also phonons, even the charge part like exciton or the plasma. Okay? So then you can actually, by analyzing the energy transfer and the momentum transfer between the outgoing photon and the incoming photons, they can map out the energy momentum dispersion of this excitation. So this has become a very powerful tool uh, recently to, uh, to use this to study you know, so-called quantum material. And also I'd like to add that especially what is also particularly powerful is that because this utilizes a resonant process, right? So this is element specific, right? So I will give an example on that. Um, so one example, so I will give, could give you a better idea. Just, let me just give you a few examples that, we, we, uh, that can highlight those capabilities. So the first example is the experiment we did to, to, uh, uh, to find, figure out the magnetic excitation in the infinite layer nuclear superconductor, which was recently has been found to be superconducting and has drawn a lot of tension in the field. So what I show here, this is a risk intensity map, part as a function, okay. Part as a function of momentum, which is horizontal axis and energy. So you see this dispersive feature, which is indicated by this ray marker here, those are the magnetic citation. So basically with this experiment, we prove that in the infinite layer system, it actually looks remarkably simple, uh, similar to the Cooper system. You also have a spin one half antiphenomatic coupled uh, uh, square lattice system, right? And also has a relatively high energy scale. For this okay, this provide your ingredient for the strong correlations. But here I want to highlight is this element specific is really the thing that make they make this experiment possible. So if you know about this material, these materials are actually thin film. It's grown on a STO substrate with a thickness about five to ten nanometers, and then kept with another layer of STO. Okay, so this to preserve the, the quality of the film. And because this is resonant, this is rigs, right? So you tune to the nickel LH. So the, the signal you get is exclusively related, is found from the nickel film. Then you don't have much information, uh, uh, contamination from the uh, strong and tightening uh, substrate. So I think that's really a, a, a very powerful uh, aspect of the rigs manual. Now, the other example I would like to give you about the rigs is that it's also sensitive to charge, collective charge excitation. Okay, so I think for that is actually very unique um, capability. And for those of you maybe in the field uh, looking at this, we know that in this cupre, a lot of uh, experiment has been done using RPES, which is sensitive to a single particle spectral function, right? So you give you the band structure and things like that. Now magnetic excitation has been, can be studied by neutron scattering and now there's also RIGS, which I just show you, but on the charge part, has been re relatively less discussed, right? I mean, now recently have a high resolution EOS. I think Mateo and, uh, and Peter Bamonte at the UIC, they have been working on that. But in the, independent of that, RIGS can, well, we can also show that is also sensitive to this kind of uh, collective charge citation. So what I show you here, again, is a RIGS momentum, uh, energy momentum map, is taken on one of the electron dot cuprate. Okay? What you see here, there are two branch of excitations, right? One is marked by the ray marker, the other is marked by the white marker, right? So the red marker, the, the white marker one is a magnetic citation that I just showed you earlier. Uh, and then the red marker is the so-called acoustic plasma that actually change the dispersion. It's very, very steep, right? And also it change with the hour frame momentum. Okay? So this is to highlight that the, the charge capability. Now the third example I want to show you is that the energy resolution of RIGS it's also making a powerful tool to identify a very weak charge order signal in the quasi-elastic region. So this is what uh, is actually was first demonstrate, demonstrated by uh, the Mindano group on YBCO, which is shown here. Okay, so this what is part here are the risk spectrum taken at different momentum. 
And then if you focus at the elastic peak, so you can see that at a certain momentum at a minus 0 0.3, you have a higher elastic peak uh, intensity, and then it goes down when you uh, move away from this position. So this is exactly the scattering from the charge order in the quasi elastic region. So this can give you a much higher sensitivity to measure the charge order for this, especially for the system that charge order sig uh, signal is very weak. Okay. As you can see that if you do this experiment with using a, uh, a regular energy integrated uh, X-ray, this is an X-ray scattering. You basically integrate all the signal, including the so-called DD citation here. So therefore, the, the structure, the thing that you get from really related to the charge order, it becomes really second, secondary. And that is especially the case for the Bismuth 2212 system I'm going to show you. Okay, so this is now for the um, example. Now next, I'd like to move, move to the, to talk about the charge order phenomena in Bismuth 2212 Cooperate. So why do I choose to look at this system? So this system, uh, the crystal structure is illustrating here. It's a bilayer system. In one unit cell, you have two, um, two couple of oxygen planes that couple together. The reason I choose this system is that this system has been exclusively studied by STM and, and RPS. Okay. So therefore, if we, uh, it would be easier to compare to the result that has been obtained from the single particle band structure and also the STM. Yeah. And for the for the um, for the STM measurement, a lot of information about a charge order specifically are primarily on the low, low temperature. There are not much of information of a high temperature because you know in STM it's very hard to do temperature dependence measurement. Yeah. And the other thing is that it's very weak, has a very weak CDW signal. And this is sort of like shown in this um, uh, uh, figure here. So this is work by Eudora uh, Nato. Um, so he, this is, was done using an integrated um, as an X-ray scattering. So that does not have energy resolution I mentioned. Basically the integration of all the photons that comes out from that particular uh, study angle of the scattering angle. So you can see, you can only see a very broad peak with a large background, right? So I think that this, this is one of the things that risk can come in and really make a very uh, much better uh, measurement of the charge order parameter. Okay, so now let me show you what I show here is a risk uh, data taken on an underdog cupre with the TC 45 Kelvin, which is deeply underdog. So it's like a, the position in the phase diagram is shown in this figure here. Okay, so I want you, uh, uh, the horizontal axis is the momentum position, uh, momentum axis, and then the vertical position is the, sorry about that. The vertical is energy loss. So let's first focus on the quasi-elastic region, which is indicated by this white dash box here. And the integrated intensity, it is shown on the figure on the right-hand panels. So you can see that there's a bright spot around 0 0.3, and there's a clear peak in the moment, uh, in the integrated intensity, the momentum distribution of this quasi-elastic peak intensity. So this it, this shows you that there is a, indeed a charge order state at the position about 0 0.3 reciprocal lattice space. And if you look at the, the width of the CDW, you can try to figure out the correlation length. And it's a very short range. In this case, it's only corresponding to about like a 15 angstrom, okay, which is just like a, a few periodicity. Mm -hmm. Just to keep, um, and this chart, the existence of charge order is certainly very doping dependent. So here I show you another extreme case. So I, uh, I'll show you the data that taken was deep inside the underdog. It's in the anti phase, right? So we, we estimate the doping of this sample is about less than 5%. It's still in the anti order uh, phase. Now you do the same measurement and you will find that there's no charge order peak in in the region that you saw earlier. Uh, and then you do in this indeed, they're also shown in this integrated MDC and uh, momentum distribution curve here, there's no observable charge density wave, meaning that the charge density wave does not exist in the anti phase. And that the onset of the charge order is at some sort of finite doping, okay? So then how about the doping dependence of this? This charge order. So then, with this, then we did a series of doping dependence. We focus on the charge order at the TC, where it's supposed to be the maximum of the CD uh, charge order uh, intensity. And you can see a gross feature here. At the underdog, the, the peak is more well defined. But when you go do more uh, higher and higher doping, the peak becomes broader and broader and becomes less and less well defined. Now, with this, we can try to fit 
the the uh, the the CD uh, the charge over the peak profile and try to extract some quantity. So yes. This was taken after the TC, so it's not in the subcoming phase. Later, I will show you the uh, the data taken in the subcoming phase, which is actually very interesting. Right. So here, they, if we plot the the fitted wave vector and the peak width, which is shown by this in these two uh, two uh, two panels here. We find that the, the, the charge order wave vector, which is corresponding to the periodicity of the of the charge order, it start it actually start to drop when you increase the doping and sort of like a saturate stay at 0 0.25 on the sequence space latest. So this 0 0.25 receiver space is actually you know an interesting number because this is exactly the four and strong, uh, so four four unicell periodicity that people normally talk about in the SDM community, right? So there appear to be a sort of some sort of characteristic doping that this CDW, this charge order behavior start to change. And if you look at the width, we also kind of uh, see, see this characteristic doping as well. We find that under doping, the correlation length always already short to start with. It doesn't really change that much, but until you reach certain doping, it start to really go up uh, onset. Uh, it's become much broader and broader. Right. And you can also try to estimate, see how like uh, to get a sense that how broad when a charge density or charge order is, they will still become start to become yield defined, right? So one way to compare is to compare the periodicity of a charge order to its correlation lens, right? If the correlation lens is shorter than your periodicity, then mean that this charge order is not well defined, it must be fluctuating, right? And that's basically the exercise we did here. Right? So we, we find that if if we we, we we plot the ratio, which is the correlation lens over the, the periodicity, right? If it's larger than one, that means that it's well defined. If it's smaller than one, means that it's, it's, it's ill defined, mean that it's uh, periodicity is now smaller than correlation lens. So larger than correlation, that, that doesn't make sense. And indeed, we also find that the crossover also happened right very close to this uh, characteristic doping between 15% uh, or 16% uh, and 13%. Now, how about the temperature dependence? Right. So what I show you here, that's uh, 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 the data taken at two doping. One is in very under dope, the other is, uh, near the um, the upper doping. So as you can see, there the behavior is kind of similar. When you raise the temperature to high temperature, the peak was does not disappear even at the room temperature. Okay, which means that the onset temperature is is high and it's very gradual. It's not a sharp charge order transition. Okay, and this is even so for the for the case in the under in the upper more dope region, you can see the peak just become broader and broader, and not even becomes. I mean, if we talk about the area underneath, it's not even become smaller. So I think that it's just become broader and and, and thing. Now the thing is interesting is uh, also interesting that when you go below TC in the, the supercondent state, which is shown by these two curve additional two curve here. Then we find that in this in this doping level, which is near the upper doping, the um, the the charge order peak start to suppress. Okay, so I think that presumably this due to the competition with the superconductivity. But later I will show you it's probably not such a simple uh, uh, story. So now the other before I move on to the charge order excitation, now I just want to mention that if you look at this. Superconductiv superconductivity related to suppression of the charge order as a function of doping in the, in the phase diagram, then you find that this suppression does not happen in all doping, okay? So you actually, in the under doping region, above and below TC, which is shown in the first panel here, it's not show much change. But near the upper mode doping, like a 90, uh, starting from like under doping 90 Kelvin to maybe over doping 90 Kelvin, you, there's a suppression of the, of the charge order. Uh, in a certain state, but when you go to very overdose, this doping depend, this temperature dependence goes away. So, which means that this uh, superconductivity induced suppression of charge order is kind of like a have a a, a dome shape like behavior, and it appears that the the strong the, the strongest effect also happened at this characteristic doping that I talked about earlier. So now, next, I would like to change gear to talk about the charge order excitation. Um, you know, uh, seen by risks. And by that, I need to explain how we see the charge order excitation using risks. And for that, I need to go back a little bit back, uh, a, a step back, and try to look at 
uh, the risk phonon cross section, uh, which give you a way to visualize the charge order excitation. So what I show you here is a is a Fermi diagram, okay, of the risk phonon cross section. So basically, what is shown here is that in this risk process, particularly the phonon emission process, is that you will have a basically this green dash line illustrate a you know uh, the propagator of the core hole because remember this is a resonance process right so we still have that part but for the electron go to the sorry about that keep jumping around when the electron go to the uh, when we promote electron to the valence state this electron which is this propagator illustrated by the red line here right so you will emit a photo a, a phonons and then go out so if you look at that the vortex of this Fermi diagram is exactly the electron phonon coupling uh, strengths. Right? So therefore, the Riggs phonon cross section should reflect the electron phonon coupling strengths. Okay? So this uh, one of this is uh, one of example of the Riggs phonon cross section. What I show here again is a Riggs intensity map of the antiphenomatic order the Bismuth two to one two system. Okay. So what I show here, this is the raw data that you show you see earlier. But on the right hand side is the elastic peak subtracted. So we can see the phonon, Rick's phonon part uh, more clearly. So you can see, and the, the lower panel is integral intensity of the Rick's phonon. So you can see it's basically just uh, like a monotonically increased curve. And this is consistent with the electron phonon coupling strengths you expect it for a uh, bound stretching mode or breathing mode in the system. Yeah. These are, These are absorption corrected, yes. And then that's got interesting thing is that remember here we have a charge propagator, right? In this risk form cross section. So if underneath the charge has additional excitation, additional contribution, contribute to the charge propagator, then you are going to see that also in the risk form cross section because they will have, in principle, you have, uh, will have some sort of phenol interference. Right, of the charge continuum and uh, this phonon. And that would be able, should be able to be seen also in the Riggs phonon cross section. To demonstrate that, we have uh, done a very simple uh, simulation. This is uh, done by our colleague, uh, Tom Devers. So what's here is a very simple 1D metallic system. And we have a uh, Einstein uh, phonon that coupled to, the, to, the, to this 1D metallic system with the momentum dependent electron phonon coupling strengths, meaning that when you have a, a larger and larger momentum, the coupling strength will become stronger and stronger. Okay, and what you see here is that because it's a one D system, there is a two kF, um, you know, charge, you know, um, this instability, right? And this is basically the final shape of the spectrum where you see here. But what is interesting thing is, uh, is showing here is that this when this two kF continuum hit the phonons branches they start to interfere and affect this apparent uh, Riggs phonon dispersion. You can see a softening in the Riggs phonon uh, dispersion and also a bright spot at these two, uh, when this charge excitation and the phonon, they start to intersect. Right? So this gives you a way to, to, to visualize the possible charge order uh, excitation. And this is very similar to what we see in the charge order. This is, oh, sorry, there's a question, yes. Hi, could you uh, define broadly what you mean by Charge order excitation. Yes, I think that, uh, that I'm going to show it here. And the previous one, there's no charge order excitation. Here, this, this charge part, right, is just from the 2KF um, scattering, okay, from this 1D system. You know, if when you have a 1D metallic system, you have a 2KF uh, the continuum thing, right? So that is that. But here, we, what we have here is really related to charge order. So let, let me just walk through here, then uh, can, I think it will answer your question. So again, what we see here is a, a Riggs intensity map for under the Bismuth 2212 system. And on the right, on the blue map here, is a elastic peak subtracted um, a spectrum, which only highlights the, the, uh, the Riggs phonon part. So you can see there's a final shape of the spectral way, right, and also a bright spot in the Riggs phonon cross section. So this is what I mean about this, the, the charge order excitations, right? Because it's emanating away, experimentally it's emanating away from the charge order wave vector. So obviously it's related to the charge order, right? And it has a behavior that's similar to what we expect when you are charge mode that intersects with the, uh, the phonon branch, yes. Uh, 
So, the question is in the one similar to this, uh, this uh, addressing the people. So, we're assuming that some sort of many orders of the charge of uh, charge order to make the 1D relevant. No, no, I think the 1D relevance is try to see if you have the additional contribution in the charge sector, what will you see in the risk phone cross section? Right? Because I try to uh, say here is that if you look at the, the, the diagram here, right? So this, there's a red, red line for the charge propagator, right? So if there is additional contribution for the, for the charge part, right? such as this 2KF continuum or charge order excitation, then you will have additional. Yes, exactly. So Either I have to think about some of the heavy surface gymnastics uh, or kind of there's one here like the genetic surface. I don't see that why actually it becomes heavy in this development. No, no, no. Okay. I think the one D here is try to just, uh, it's more like a demonstration purpose to show that if you have something in the charge sector, they will affect your risk for non-cross section. But I agree that in the 2D system, it's not necessary you have a, a family surface nesting, especially for a charge order. Uh, I, I don't think it has anything to do with the family surface nesting. But if the charge order can also give you excitation, which is on the charge sector, if that happens, they will contribute to your charge propagator. That should also affect your risk for cross section. Yeah, I think that's my what I try to establish here. Okay, so I think we have done this. I think another, so to, to really show, uh, 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 to really assure you that, you know, you can compare to the antiferromatic order uh, compound, which does not have a charge order, and look at how different are their uh, looks phonon cross section, right? For the case they don't have a charge order, the phonon is just, just smooth and monotonic, but the one that has a charge order, which is on the one on the right, Right, you have uh, this final shape of uh, excitations and things like that. Right? So with this, right, so we can talk about how to track this behavior in temperature and the docking right, in the phase diagram. So first of all, let me, let me show you that, uh, uh, the temperature dependence. Right? So what I show here is uh, on the uh, sample that's taken near optimal doping. Okay? So uh, what we see is that when you warm up the temperature from TC, you see this rich phonon dispersion become flatter and flatter which kind of makes sense because the charge order become broader and broad, right? So the excitation should also become broader and the inference to a risk phonon should also become less. Right? But the interesting thing is that when you go to supercolony state, which is shown by those uh, blue marker here, the, if the inference on the, on the risk phonon dispersion is actually become stronger and stronger. Right? So for example, what I, what, you, what, what I show here in the, uh, the 15 Kelvin, right? You see a very sharp dip. Right, in the risk phonon. And you can sort of like see that directly in this risk phonon map here, right? In the, the deeper in the solar state, the stronger the, the risk phonon uh, 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 softening is, right? And this is just another detail, the integrated phonon intensity, and right? uh, it's basically also saying the same thing, right? So if, again, if you, then with this, if you try to measure across the, the phase diagram, it's a function of doping, right? At the uh, deep below the, the TC, we find that this softening, a superconductivity enhanced softening, right? Actually only, only happen near the optimal dope region. I mean, for the very under dope one and also over dope one, there's almost no change, you know, at TC and below TC. Yes. How should I think physically think of the size excitation dispersion. You're saying it's a continuum. Um, do you have some idea of what causes it? Yes, bear with me. I, I have a slide for that. Um, yeah, uh, but I will come to that point uh, later. Right. So with that, we can put the, the, uh, the behavior of the charge order that we see in the quasi-elastic region and the 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 in the risk phonon together and we find that's a very interesting paradox that uh, we have here. So first of all, just an overview of the raw data map um, uh, for this optimal dope system that has you know a below TC and above TC. You can see this risk phonon part and the CD they are both change with temperature. Okay. So now the interesting thing is that if you put them together, right? Although for the part of the temperature dependence above TC, that makes sense. Because on the one hand, you see the, the CDW become broader. So therefore you expect the charge, dense, uh, the charge order excitation become weaker and has less influence to the, to the, uh, to the mixed phonon. 
But why is paradox uh, or like a puzzling is that when you go to lower temperature, the CDW all the parameters actually decrease, suppress in a superconducting state. However, the the, the spectral wave of the charge order excitation appear to be enhanced right, in the superconducting state. Right? So this kind of like a opposite of what you what you expect. And then to answer your your question, like right? so usually when we talk about the charge also order excitation. Right. We talk about the excitation in a long range order part. Right. So, for example, in the long range, when you have a long range order, the sorry, the collective excitation are primarily two part, two kind. One is the amplitude mode, the other is the phase mode, and they should have a should be well defined mode, should be sharply defined mode. Okay. And the spectral way of this mode should sort of like a correlate with your strength of order parameter, which means that if your order parameter is stronger, you should expect the spectral way of this mode should be also stronger. When it's weaker, then you should expect the your excitation, right? Spectral wave should be also weaker. And this is not, what, not the case we saw in the optimum top case. But there's another case that if, if the system is somehow closer to a critical point, a right, chronic critical point, like a low temperature, what you could have is that the other prime that become weaker, but the inelastic part here, there's no sharply defined mode because now you are close to a quantum critical point. But you do have a large spectral wave for those excitation. So we argue that this is more the what we saw here, the temperature we saw here is more closer to the second case. But now, how do we understand the superconductivity, the temperature dependence? Right? How do we understand this picture? How does how the superconductivity comes in to make this excitation stronger? Right. So the, the arguments are following. Okay. Oh, sorry. Right, so we should look at this part when we are very close to a quantum critical point. You have a, you know, the other parameter is weak, but you have a strong uh, quantum fluctuation in the inelastic uh, channels. Now, when you are at the high temperature, there's no superconducting gap, right? So you have a large particle and whole continuum, and those will damp out your quantum fluctuation spectrum. Now, the interesting thing is that when you go to a superconducting state, there's a sharp superconducting gap open, right? So then there's much less particle hole and uh, particle hole continuum can damp your quantum fluctuations. And therefore the quantum phase fluctuations sort of like being restored, become stronger. So that's why they sort of like kind of explain why you would go to deep, deeper in the superconducting state, we see stronger and stronger the spectral of the charge order excitation. Now, if that's true, right? So maybe then we can compare this then uh, uh, in the, as a function of doping, and try to identify where this possible or putative quantum critical point would be, right? So here, as, uh, as I um, uh, mentioned earlier, that this effect, we see this kind of anonymous, anonymous temperature dependence effect more strongly in the near optimal doping region. And it appears that this is also strongest near the, uh, you know, this, this, this characteristic doping between 15% and 13%, yes. Just a quick question. So, if I remember correctly, there is a, there is a number of papers by Fidel Swan, Sachin that say that when you are close to a quantum critical point, the, the, the phase ones uh, and the, the amplitude one become like two equals. So, if you look at the dispersion reaction, not the real dispersion, you have just two equals. Exactly. And the onset was uh, I. Exactly. So yes. 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 And if, well, here we 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 use we didn't see the mode directly, right? It's sort of like a, we know, but what we know is a, it's a kind of a very broad, continual type of thing emanating away from a charge order that influence the risk phonon cross section. In a sense, that it should be a very broad continuum, and as far you respect for a quantum critical point excitation. Okay, so then this may be suggest that if they, this indeed, if this is indeed related to the quantum critical point, then this quantum critical point should be roughly near the, the, the PC, right? Near the optimal doping. But this is not airtight, right? Because if this is a, a, a real quantum critical point, we should expect the charge order should disappear beyond this doping level. But the fact that we see the charge order signal still proceeds right, to a very high doping well beyond PC. So therefore, I would say this is still an open question. There are, there are some aspects of it fit to this picture, but some aspect does not. But here, I just want to also mention that, you know, um, um, at the discrete component, the property of charge order does change, right? And also the, the quasi-elastic region in our spectrum is, de is defined by our energy resolution. In this case, it's still 
40 MeV. So maybe that if we have a better resolution to like a less than 10 MeV, then we can really see a more clearly the real outer parameter behavior, then maybe we'll have a different picture here. Okay. okay, so I think, okay, I think I'm almost run out of time, but um, I will just uh, quickly go through some of the discussion part. Then I'd like to address what quickly about a question about how does this related to the pseudo gap phase, right? So I think there are a number of uh, many experiments have been done to address the, the, the pseudo gap property, but uh, um, uh, I think here I especially highlight two measurements. One is the recent paper on RPES, which shows that at 19% at doping, the pseudo, gap, the pseudo gap phase abruptly disappear at 19%. And on the right-hand side, there's another, it's another paper uh, from STM, which also kind of suggests that there's a sudden change of the Fermi surface topology, especially this Fermi arc, right? Uh, presumably related to pseudo gap, disappear sort of like a, at a, above 19%. But here in our experiment, the charge order does not really show any abrupt change at the 19%, right? So in this aspect that the charge order phenomena that we see here does not seem to directly related to the pseudo gap property here. Now, the last question I would like to address here, how about the charge order excitation relation to the superconductivity, right? We see there's a lot of interplay there, but how does that help, you know, for, for example, this CDW excitation, if, it, if it's a, a quantum fluctuation, there are theory to think that maybe help the TC, right? Does that help the superconductivity? I think that's still open question, but there are some point that we can make is that if we, we compare the two, the, the superconductive gap uh, value, with the, the strength of the charge order excitation, which is shown in this figure here. Uh, and we find, we find here is that the superconducting gap is kind of like flat in the region from 8% to 19%. But our charge order excitation, which is sort of like a change very dramatically in this range. So I think this suggests that this charge order excitation does not really help directly for the pairing interaction uh, for the Cooper pairs. Okay. But here, I want to also mention that the, we know that the TC, the superconductor the uh, super temperature does not really directly related to the pairing strength in Cooper. Right? So I mean, here, although the gap size is flat, but we know the TC also dramatically uh, uh, varies. So I would say this is still one of the open questions, but at least it seems to suggest it does not help directly to the pairing uh, strength. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm kind of running out of time. So I'm not going to uh, go much detail in the, um, uh, even in the Nicholas system, but also has been published last year. So if you are interested, please let me know. I can, I, I would be happy to, to discuss with you more about this. But I just want to mention that in the, in the Nicholas system, we find one of the system and then uh, Lenson Nicolet also has a charge order uh, uh, phase in, and it's also kind of near the superconductive phase and raise a very interesting question about, again, the relation between charge order and the, the superconductivity. I think this is still one of the open questions that uh, will be pursued uh, by, by in this field. Okay, so with that, I'd like to uh, put on the summary of my talk. So uh, in this, in my presentation, I primarily focus on the charge order phenomenon in uh, Bismarck's 212 system. And from our experiment, it seems to suggest that there's a characteristic doping uh, for this charge order phenomenon. Right? Whether it's a quantum critical point or not, I think it's still not airtight possible, some, some aspects of it seem to fit, but some of them also doesn't seem to fit. So I think that's still one of the interesting questions that could be, if we have a better control for the sample, for example, then maybe we can, we can have more information. So with that, I would like to thank your attention. Hey, thank you very much. Um, maybe for the people on the, uh, you know, tell them if they want to ask a question. Yeah, if people on the Zoom want to uh, type questions into the chat window or the Q&A, uh, please do so. Um, that was really good. Thank you. Um, this might be uh, uh, naive and incorrect, uh, the first thing to keep um, and all, it seems to me like if you have charge order being suppressed due to some reason, um, it, you almost expect the expect there to be more excitations associated with charge order um, because it's no longer order, right? Um, 
is, is, is there even this is not what you expected? Clearly, this is um, one of the one of the questions that drove uh, this work. So I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question. You Can are... you repeat the question for the Zoom audience too? I I can't hear it from here. Yeah, no, I, I was just I was just saying it, it. It seems to me like if if charge order is suppressed for some reason, you would almost expect the expect there to be more of these um 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 expectations associated with charge order because you have less order and you have more kind of uh, um breaking with the order, which is what these expectations typically are. Right. And that is that is what we see. Is that not yeah, that, that's what we see. But I, I would say it's not to me, it's not necessarily obvious. I think the question is that wouldn't it a nature wouldn't it be natural to expect that if the charge order has been suppressed, so in general, by the superatomic activity, and then you expect the excitation of a charge order would become stronger. I, I think it's, it's not obvious to me that would be the case, right? So if if there's not a concrete point, then you have what you have here is like what has been described like a Landau theory. Right. So it's a competition of two other parameters. One is the superconductivity, the other is the charge order. Right. So when they in a in the superconductive state, the superconductivity wins, right? So the charge order becomes less. But then more that means that more electron has been turned to superconductivity. So therefore the excitation that will be associated with the charge order, which is that you, you need to excite them, right? So then they become less because you have less charge order to start with. So then in that case, you actually become smaller. Right. So I think that that's why. But that's a singular question. That's that's, that's, good, uh, that's a good question. So also why I think this is a kind of like a, a very interesting puzzle to us. You know, we're open to other interpretation. Actually, I'm very interested to interested to know whether there's other interpretation. But so far, it seems to be the quantum fluctuation interpretation seems to fit uh, the best. Thank you. Okay. So you mentioned the single band emission of sequence. Which means inside of the hybridized copper oxygen band, uh, or what have you. So, is there any information to be gained from the elemental state of the particular by either measuring up the oxygen or the copper end for the community to be inclined to gain something? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Actually, here I only talk about the, the work that we did focused on the, on the copper LH, right? So, you could do really. Can you please repeat oxygen. the question? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Thank yes, you. I'm sorry about that. So okay. I, I, uh, if I understand correctly, the question would be, can you the new information, if you look at, um, uh, use risks at a different age to look at copper and the oxygen, right? whether you can learn different um, new information about it. Is that basically the question? Yes, yeah. So yes, I think if you, what I show here is just only the copper LH, but in the literature, there are also quite a bit of other works recently uh, try to use oxygen oxygen age, risk at oxygen age, try to look at uh, this phenomenon. The thing is that it, it is a different projection to the orbital, right? So it's not necessarily uh, completely the same, but in general, from a technical point of view, uh, first of all, the, at the oxygen age, because the photon, photon energy is lower, so you get a better energy resolution. So you can see those structure better. And, and but they also see a, basically a consistent result here that means that at the CDW position, there is additional charge contribution that emanating from, from the charge order. And that's like the charge order excitation. But there's a, indeed, there is a something we still don't quite uh, can, can get by comparing these two. For example, can we do this, try to figure out how the charge order project to copper and the oxygen, this kind of question. But I think unfortunately those, it's a difficult question because it's a different measurement. But it's certainly still something that still uh, we'll we'll try to think about how to do it better. Other questions? Do you have any written questions? No. There's no questions uh, from the Zoom audience. Could, could, could you, because uh, I'm not in the field and so it's sort of dumb fact, but when you say charge order, suppose I took a picture of it, you know, and spatially, but well, what what matters is the charge order? Back? Yes. So in um, in in this case, it's it's a just like what you say, right? So it's a you have a periodic modulated charge density. In this particular case, in this particular uh, particular case, it's more like a, you have a region that more like a stripe type of 
uh, a chart order in one 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 part one part, and then the other part you may have maybe stripe on the other direction. This kind of thing, right? Yeah. So this is not directly from my experiment. This is like in the literature when people do scattering, more careful scattering experiment, try to look at different geometry and polarization. There's a so far the, the conclusion. So it's more like a different type of uh, you know different domains of the stripe uh, spread. You know, it's right? information. It's not like a checkerboard pattern. Yeah, it's not. I mean, the reason that it's not a checkerboard pattern is that from X-ray scattering experiment, we didn't see the QQP, which means that you should see, if it's a checkerboard pattern, you should see the diagonal also have a diffraction peak, but no one have ever seen that. Let's see, any uh, last questions? Okay, well, thanks very much for a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.